Kia ora, no my hearty, my welcome to another Aotearoa rugby pod with a lot to unpack between the All Blacks and the Black Ferns. Quite different results over the weekend. So much to talk about. I'm joined by James Parsons and also Bryn Hall. I'm Ross Carl. The Aotearoa rugby pod comes to you every week here on Sky. Boys, the All Blacks. Let's start there. Jipper, were you surprised that it was going to be that was this big a win in the end? Um, I suppose it was to um, the Welsh's own demise. I think if you look at that first forty, they had a, like ample opportunities in the attacking twenty-two, and you know a couple of times it was skill set error um, turned over due to that uh, rush defence of the ABs. Other time was going to the corner and um, overthrowing a couple of lineouts. And then when they finally got that charge down and, and led to that scrum, they gave away a scrum penalty. So. I, I think I was surprised in the sense of the amount of opportunities they had um, that they didn't pounce on them. But then if you look at the way um, Sam Whitelock uh, made decisions to really build in the style of play, the All Blacks went through the middle a lot. Uh, we saw Artie Savia do it um, time and time again and his post-contact metres were you know, seriously impressive. And even when they made a little error, I think Dave Harvilli bobbled it early and they picked through the middle. They're always making good gains through the middle. And that's quite energy sapping defence because you're always, you know, having to creep back, creep back, and, and get in behind and fill, fill those roles. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned before, Sam Whitelock went for the three, built that scoreboard pressure, and then once that was built, you saw them just ratchet things up. Um, you know, obviously Will Jordan's um, brilliance, but with a little um, work off the ball from Ethan Blackadder to just get a little escort that created a little bit more space, and then the 65th minute quick throw in was them just tightening the screws again um, where, where Seva Reese scored. Um, so not surprised with how um, they orchestrated it um, and, and not surprised with the amount of opportunities. You know, like I had in my notes, um, they'll be devastated with the amount of opportunities they left out there, the Welsh in that first 40 in particular. Hmm. It's quite a flourish at the end there, Bryn. Those support players and the way that they scored those tries, it was quite something. It doesn't matter whether the opposition's under strength. To pull off some of those tries takes vision and execution of a really high level. Yeah, it does. And look, when you, and look when you can score 36, 36 points in the second half, but I thought it was the, all the work was really done in that first half. Jip brought up some really good points around them going through the middle, especially Artie Severe. I think in that first half, he was fantastic around getting it over the advantage line with Traditionally, um, with the Welsh and even the Northern Hemisphere teams, they tend to have a really good line speed pressure, but a really good way that you can um, you can break through that is going through the middle early on, which they even did. You know, even look at Nepalo Lalu, he's probably kicking himself, um, dropping that ball over the line. It would have been his first meat pie, but, you know, that kind of um, game plan was, was implemented really, really well in that first half. And, and look, I think the Welsh had plenty of opportunities. You know, it was in that, that, in that first half ahead of my notes. It was the 37th and the 39th minute is when they had opportunities inside their half and there were two overthrows that kind of just stunted their, their momentum. And I guess against the All Blacks, you couldn't really afford to, to give them that much, um, to give them more opportunities to not um, get it right. And then, you know, the game was in the balance in probably that 60th minute. And, and Wayne Pivak actually brought up a really good point is that even though they weren't uh, playing, oh, they're playing well and, and kind, of, kind of staying in the fight. And then Reese Priestling came on and uh, puts it in that, that, that little grubber through on the 59th minute. To get them back in the game, and then just from that um, from that kick off that exit, um, you know that, that that penalty that really just stunted that, that that kind of try. It was an easy out for the All Blacks, and then I guess from that kind of mistake of that penalty that the Welsh gave away after scoring that try, it pretty much just opened up the floodgates through that. So um, I think the Welsh can take can take a lot of learnings, a lot of learnings from there. And it's what I heard from Wayne Pivak in his in his post match is that um, yes, they did throw a lot at them, but I think in the kind of big test matches in those kind of moments. You just can't afford to give the All Blacks too many opportunities. But then, 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 like you said, Ross, you know, been able to score some of the tries. You know, the, I thought the bench came on and played really well in that last twenty minutes, where they were probably a little bit, um, you know, a little bit hungry to, in that kind of globe globe style trotters kind of set up last week with so much points being scored. But you know, I thought they came on really well and um, even added, you know, Sebi Reese came on and, but even for his try, you know, he had three or four touches and you know, you could just see the the excitement of him being um, in and around the ball. So. Um, overall, I thought it was a great performance, and um, we talked about Bodie as well. Look, I thought he was he was the best on park, not just with the intercepts. You know, how many times have we seen that in his career with the All Blacks, and even at the Blues, and even the Hurricanes? It's not by luck that that happens. And um, you know, he even said it was it was a tough week for him. You know, think about it's your hundredth game. You don't want to have a stinker. And you've played a hundred games, and you know it's a little bit different preparing um, for the three hundredth game. But now, look, I thought he was he was outstanding. Artie Severe 
Um, and then no doubt we'll touch on a few more um, All Blacks if there were standouts in the game as well. Mm, Adi Savier's ability to get over the gain line, you know, it just never ceases to amaze, especially when you look at him pound for pound, Jipper. Oh, look, I, I had him down as best on park, personally. I, I thought his game, it's one of the best test matches I've seen him play. It's the post-contact metres that, you know, just blows your mind. He just seems to keep coming out the other side. Even if people hang on to him, he'll drag them another couple of metres. Massive turnover in the 22-metre zone, um, key time in defence. Uh, you know, talk about Sevi Reese's try and Rico Ioane. Well, who's there as well with them? Adi Savir in the 65th minute after doing a hell of a lot of toil in that first 40. So his work off the ball, um, you know, normally I, I take a deeper look into, into players' stats that stand out to me, but I, I just didn't need to on this occasion because I, I really wanted to emphasise his work off the ball and attack in D created opportunities for others, but also when he had his chance to roll up his sleeve on, on defence, he was physical, he was dominant, or he was in, in that breakdown getting turnovers and ball in hand was spoken about. Uh, sensational performance. Um, you know, he was he was world class um, against against a, a really strong um, Welsh pack that, that fought hard. You know, I thought their Lucy's fought. You know, Moriarty while he was on there until he until he went off was good. Um, you know, B Basham um, was was really good and busy and and you know new into his career and Wainwright was physical. So they were up against some big men that were looking to show and assert that dominance, and, and he led the way. Mm. When you talk about the work off the ball and attack, what kind of stuff are you talking about? Well, let's use the 65th minute. Uh, Geordie Barrett puts that kick through. Um, Reeks and um, Sevo are chasing through to regather it, and, and Artie's on the edge, and as I said, he's put some big shift minutes in, and he, he works off the ball to be in a position where he can receive a, a, a pop-up offload to then offload it back to Sevo Reeks to score the try. Um, you know, so often enough, it could have been easy for him to think that that play was over, but he stayed engaged, he stayed involved, and that's why he's been in the All Blacks for so long. Um, you know, he, he was massive in, in that moment. Well, I suppose an interesting selection for them, Bryn, coming up now is with Dalton Papali'i being so impressive again on the weekend. You've obviously got Sam Kane returning. Uh, you've got a game against Italy where maybe they'd give Sam Whitelock a rest. Um, before the bigger games and the test matches. What do you do this weekend against Italy at number seven? Oh, look, I think they'll, they'll, we're going to see a lot of changes, I think. Um, you know, to give guys an opportunity to kind of um, put their hand up for the next coming two test matches. And, you know, look, that's no disrespect to Italy. And um, it's a different place playing in Rome. And a lot of those guys, younger fellas, probably haven't played there. But I think it is an opportunity to give guys um, an opportunity to play. So whether that's Sam Kane coming back in, you've got Dane Coles as well. Does Richie come in and you give Bodie a week off? Um, you know, even the likes of, you know, Sevu, Luke Jacobson, you know, kind of players like that. So I think that, um, I think Sam might come in to actually come and start, given some minutes. He's, um, you know, from Ian Foster's words, he wanted to bring him in and have some good training underneath, under his belt, even though he played that test match against the USA. And I think it's a, um, it's a good opportunity to bring him in, get him some, some meaningful minutes. And then, you know, depending on how he goes, you know, Dalton's played really, really well. So, you know, it's a good opportunity for Sam to come in and then stake his claim to, to get back to where we know Sam Kane is, is going to be. Couple couple of interesting positions for me um, is Locke. Not sure where Brody's injury's at. So, um, you know, we might see some, um, you know, opportunity for Josh Lord and Tupovai to start. Um, and then if, you know, looking, if they're not going to bring someone in, depending on how bad Brody's um, injury is, um, you know, is there a makeshift Lucy? that can potentially move into that locking space um, for the other two tests coming up and, and potentially looking at giving him time. I'm sure Brody's fine, um, but that's what I was thinking about going into this Italian test, um, if, if they can create some opportunity for some guys that can potentially fill that role. Um, you know, it will be huge. huge. And I agree with Bryn, I, I think Sam Kane will come back into the mix and start um, and, and get some good minutes under his belt. Is Dalton close to pushing Sam for his position when Sam's back to full flight? I think that's too hard a discussion. Like, like I think Dalton is is physically ready and, and, and ready for Tier 1 Nation um, test football. And, and I think the plan is with Sam is just to, um, you know, slowly progress him back into that Tier 1, um, you know, Nation football. So, you know, he's had a great opportunity against the US and, and, and now another opportunity against Italy. Um, and then, you know, they'll probably reassess and make some decisions there, you know, heading into the Irish and, and French test weeks. 
We've got a few minutes into the record. We might as well talk about Bowden Barrett versus Richie Moonga. <laughs> um, uh, is it the same ten this week, uh, Bryn? Do you think, or is it a, a mix up? I think it's a it's an opportunity to give, to give Richie a go, and you know, you know, Bodie had an outstanding game on the weekend, and um, you know, played really, really well. And I think it's not going to be a form thing when it comes to Bodie because look, he's been for there for the majority of that rugby championship, um, played consistently well, and has a lot has had a lot of time. Whereas you know, Richie did play that game against the Americans and um, he got what he needed to get out of that. But um, I think it's a it's a good time to be able to put Richie in there um, and being able to have that combination with Davey as well, you know, possibly so. Because I think with the thing with Davey as well that, you know, he's had a game, he had a game off and then come back and go forth. So I think it's important for, I think even Davey as well, to be able to get him in there, um, to be able to play some consistent minutes playing back to back. But in saying that, Quinn Tapai is knocking on the door, so whether Quinn gets an opportunity as well, um, you know, there could be a lot of changes, but um, I think Richie, yeah, could come into the fold, especially with how uh, Bodie played on the weekend, give him, give Bodie a week off, or possibly off the bench, and then, um, you know, you even give the likes of Damo, possibly coming into fullback as well, and giving Geordie a rest, so there's just so many great players at the moment that probably need um, a little bit more game time, because you'd like to think that this probably Italian game is a probably your last chance on this tour to get a few guys with the opportunity to play those two test matches against Ireland and then the big one against France in a fortnight's time. So you go back to back against Ireland and France, do you, Jipper, with your, your top team? Is that the way you play it out? Again, I find that hard because you've got to see how like banged up they are and see who's in the best physical shape. And I think that's the beauty of the squad at the moment is the competition. So I think there might be a, you know, a penciled in team potentially for that two week slot but it's it's just um you know two different styles two different um sort of um intensity of the opposition um you know like I, I just think they'll leave themselves the ability to adjust um post that irish test mm. so the top 10 15 combo uh, <laughs> we like to talk about it um is it still Bodie and Geordie or you know Richie and probably um Damien were maybe it at the very start of the year but what do you think Bryn? oh they can go they can go either way you know you look look if you think you look around Bodie and Geordie you know they've been consistently in probably the last you know four four test matches have been that um have been that 10 and 15 combination and uh, you know the thing I like about Geordie is that um the thing that he has, obviously, he's a, he's a larger body compared to Damon. Look, this is no disrespect to, to Damon, but it's just different qualities that, that Jordy has and the fact that he is taller and with probably Ireland, with Connor Murray, even Jameson Gibson Park and the nines that they do have there, that aerial game is possibly going to come and even with the likes of the French as well, being able to kick off with, du, with DuPont. So he brings a really good aerial um, game for Jordy and the fact that he's a goal kicker as well. A goal kicker has been a, probably a massive um, positive for Jordy and what he can add add to that group because um, he's been cons- he's been kicking consistently well when, when Bodie's been at 10. But, um, you know, you, then you have, you've seen Richie and Damo. We saw that earlier as well, that combination. And, and what I do like about that combo is that they can both play it, um, at first receiver. And even if Richie takes it to the line, you know, Damo can step right up either side, open side or short side. and can be that first that first five receiver or play as a first five like he, like he does for the Chiefs or even with the All Blacks as well. So uh, there is a bit of difference around that. And what you what you can do is if you have... Um, have um, have Damo at 15, you've got the ability then to be able to bring, um, you know, a, a winger midfielder on the bench as well because Damo can cover 10 as well. So um, both both can go well, but I think if, if it was to make a decision today just based on the form of how the competition's gone and how the season's gone, you'd have to probably go with Bodie and Geordie uh, at this stage. You're on the same boat, Chip? Yeah, look, I am purely because of the, the Tier 1 um, nation run they've had. And I suppose the control and form they're in. It's no different when Richie was in form and had had more, um, I suppose, minutes in the saddle when Bodie came back from Japan. Um, and, and I think they'll continue on with that. But, I mean, don't rule out uh, more minutes uh, for Richie in, in upcoming games. You know, like it was Bodie's big night and, and he played um, deep, obviously, and um, played for the 80 minutes and, and Richie came on as well. But... Um, I, I think you know you, you'll see him get more and more minutes if he does remain on the bench um, in, in the bigger tests as well. I know we go on about this debate every single week, so maybe let's capture it. Uh, for me, I think it's more interesting than Mertz versus Spencer. Like I can't remember kind of a rivalry for a position that's been this interesting in my time watching the All Blacks. But when you consider that and we start talking about where Bowden Barrett, now All Black Test Centurion, 
World Cup winner, where he sits in the pantheon of number 10s in the history of New Zealand rugby, considering he's not always the first choice 10. Where does he sit, Jipper? Where do you see him coming in that list? Oh, man, I, I think he's, he's right in the mix. And he's still got time to go. Um, when I texted him during the week to, to wish him well for his 100th, I said, you've dedicated yourself to your craft. And you'll be remembered as a great All Black for that. You know, it, it, he's made a lot of choices along the way to make him the very best player in the world a number of times, and continues to be at that high level. Um, and, and and he's just not done. Um, so it, it's a hard conversation to have at the moment because I still think there's more chapters to the story, just like there was for DC, um, and and more, uh, I suppose, excitement and and um, fuel for this debate. Where are you sitting, Brenner? Yeah, it is. He, he, he's, he's got a long. He's got a long way to go. The fact you know he's, he seems to be he's been here so long, considering he's played a hundred test matches. But Chip's right. You know he's he's right up there. You've got Dan Carter, who you know we don't need to talk about the the, the achievements that he's have. Is just you know he he could say arguably he's the greatest rugby player that's ever played in the world. So, but you know what Rick, what um what Bodie has done. You know he's, he's a two time player of the year. You know that's you know those are achievements that. I've done at a pretty high world-class um, setup. So, you know, the fact that he's done that twice, I mean, he was playing 10 as well. You've got to add that into the discussion. And for the fact of longevity, any time you can play 100 test matches, whether it be, you know, for a time of 15, coming off the bench, but, you know, being able to play 100 test matches and that consistency of to be in that all-black group for a long period of time, um, that adds to it as well. But, yeah, I think, look, the, the best still to come of Bodie, and, um, you know, we're going to continue to have these discussions about him and Richie moving forward, but... You know, I think, you know, for having Richie there to, to be able to have that competition aspect, um, it's going to keep bringing the best out of Bodie. And look, if we can get test matches like we do on the weekend, and you've got Richie be able to be in behind him and um, to try and bring the best out of Bodie, and it goes vice versa both ways, it's only going to help New Zealand rugby and for our bid um, to win a World Cup in, in a couple of, in a couple of um, years' time. I really enjoyed that right grin from you, Jip, then when uh, DC was announced as the greatest player of all time. I'm actually in that boat. I'm in the DC as the best rugby player I've ever seen boat. Um, where do you stand on this? On Dizzy? Yeah. Is he, is he the greatest oh, rugby player I, in the day? Oh, him, and, him or Richie, mm. uh, I reckon. Like, he's definitely there, but le like, let's not forget the hard graph that goes in to provide that beautiful <laughs> ball to be played off. <laughs> the forwards lay the platform for the greatest rugby player of all time. So, you know, well, let's put it in there Recorded at all. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a hard argument, but I'm a Ford man. Of course, I'm going to back Richie. I did say <laughs> arguably. I did say arguably. I forgot to um, mention the old, the old great Richie McCall. He's right up there as well. So it's hard to go past those two. Just thank God they're right. They're Kiwis. So. It's one of them. The it's one of them. Put yeah, it two that Kiwis. Way. Yeah. 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 For, for me, it's, it's Dan. And the reason it's with Dan is because you, he did turnovers, he'd make his tackles, he'd run the ball, he kicked goals. You know, he kicked field position. There's a few things that Dan Carter did that Richie McCaw never had the chance to do, I suppose, because of his position. But Dan could do literally every single thing on the field, I thought, bar, you know, throwing I, into a line out or backing a scrum. I'd, I'd love I'd love to you find a clip of one of uh, his turnovers. Um, I'd, I'd be interested <laughs> in that. <laughs> <laughs> They're there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fish them out. We'll get some of the boys onto it. We'll see what we can do. Please do. Please do. <laughs> I've got a couple of vivid Memories of them uh, later on in games at times when you know there's a few tired boys out there, but there definitely were some. <laughs> Richie probably made a tackle and got got it up for him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think Desi would be first to point towards Richie. Yeah, it, it, it's it's um it's oh yeah, it's good banter. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, now banter is something that's been going on and around this game because the yellow card for Nepal Laulala was an interesting call. The Welsh, a lot of Welsh people I've seen online are saying that was a red. Um, the referees decided mitigating circumstances yellow as the player buried his head into his forearm. Uh, where do you sit on this, Bryn? Yeah, look, I yeah. Frustrated would probably be the word that I'd use because look, as a rugby player, yes, we've got a, an, an understanding around like it's not common sense because like you've got to go the letter of the law and by the letter of the law you know his his forearm or his kind of shoulder went into his head but at the same time as a rugby player you think like the guy's ducking his head right down at a low at a low height 
and Nippo's actually tried to like just go through a low technique tackle. Like if you talk around head highs that it from uh, from previous um, send offs, um, it's been you know you've got the t- the tackle technique wrong, and it's just been able to go up, and you've got probably been sent off for the right reason. But you know, there's nothing re- there's nothing that Nippo Lalala in that situation could have done to be able to stop that situation there. So yes, I understand that you know there's going to be yellow card, and they 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 talked around it and and went through that, but. For me as a rugby player, it's really hard to be able to get behind that decision because I think there's only so much that the tackler can do to be able to get that right. You know, Jip or, or Ross, you see that and you look at that example, there's nothing that Nepal Lala could have done to be able to try and get that any better. So do you start reward? Do you have to, you kind of, for that kind of situation, it's a unique situation, but those kind of ones that that happen, common sense, common sense has to prevail. But I know we're trying to look after. There's a law that's going to be able to put in place, and it's going to probably, if, if that did happen, then it's going to open up the door uh, for other avenues for it to happen in, in other games. But for me, as just a rugby player, I found it really frustrating. I could understand the reason behind it, but Nepal Lala couldn't have done anything better or anything more to try and nullify that and get that wrong at all. So yeah, it's just a penalty well, for the shot yeah, to the head? Say again? So you just make it a penalty for the shot to the head? Is that essentially what, what yeah. you do? Yeah, so for me... For me, it's it's just it's just a penalty because I know that there's obviously laws in place and there's been there's been other examples where that, that isn't the case and so there's been a yellow card offence. But for that one there, you just think when yes, his, 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 he has hit his head. But at the same time, look, he's putting his head down, putting it right down. So like, where's he supposed to go? So for me personally, if they just walked away there and said, look, this is just a penalty because there's obviously factors at, at hand that is probably a little bit common sense thinking. Um, then they would have got that right. But again, I can understand why they've done it. Um, there's, yeah, It won't be the last one that we talk around. But for me personally, I was left frustrated um, with that yellow card. When I watched the game, I found it interesting that the yellow card was given for not wrapping. It wasn't anything to do with the head contact. Um, so it was saying he, he was basically tucking his shoulder and, and not um, attempting to wrap in the tackle. But the irony is, is I think as he's going to wrap, that's when he makes contact with the head. Um, and that's why it looks like it doesn't look like he's trying to wrap. That's stupid as it sounds. Mm-hmm. I watched it a couple of times, but he hits his head and it tucks the arm back in. But for me, if if, if you look at um, Wallaby's hooker, Fyanga, he, he does this grass cut and gets penalised for it all the time. And that's the only real option that Nepo has. Like, that's a low position. He's in a pretty low position. Mm-hmm where he is. So the other thing is he's got to leave his feet in grass cut, which isn't allowed either. Um, so look, it was a tough situation for the ref to be in, but you see contact with the head. I felt like they brought into mitigating circumstances. I, I don't think if we were this time last year, that could have been a red. I mean, it touched the head um, and it puts you in um, dangerous territory. I, I, I felt like he, the way he um, said the yellow card was for no wrapping, um, was probably surprising. I thought it would have been the head mitigated down from a red to a yellow. Um, but it just shows, I suppose, there is still this confusion in the game for all of us. We all interpreted it differently. Mm. Mm. Those two things, I suppose, just go hand in hand, don't they? Like the, the head and the wrapping. You, at, at such a short period of time when the player bounces off another player's body, you can't really say whether one thing's worse than the other because it's just instantaneous, right, Jim? But that's that's what I'm trying to say is like, Nepo is going to get penalised either way. Because he dips, he doesn't get low enough, um, and he hits his head as he's going to wrap, or he does the Fyanga style, <laughs> he's going to get penalised. You know, like it, it's, um, yeah, it was, uh, if you get that that dipping motion and you're a big man like Nepo, it is, it sounds like I'm making excuses for him, but that's a, he'll be, you know, rubbing the grass with his face. Um, if, you know, <laughs> like he was, he was pretty low. He was definitely mm. dipping. Um, but look, from my point of view, as soon as there's contact with the head, you knew it was either going to be um, red or yellow, not just a penalty. And I thought the mitigating circumstances were taken into account and consistent with a lot of other things we've seen. It was just when he said it was for not rapping, I was confused. Mm. Mm. So it's a better place than last year, but still not perfect. Well, it's not oh, a perfect year, yeah. is it? Yeah. It's... it's um, I just, you know, there's three of us here and we saw it all differently, you know, like um, as long as it's consistent on the night, this is what I always say with referee decisions, as long as it's consistent on the night over the 80, it's about, you know, that's part of the game is how good you are as, at adjusting to the ref 
and finding where the boundaries are and where the boundaries aren't. And that's what makes you a better player or a better team. So that's part of it is that 80 minute window. And if there's consistency across that, I'll never complain because mm. it, you just can't expect a replication. Just like as a player, you can't expect a replication. When you play 10 out of 10, you're most probably not going to do 10 out of 10 next week unless you're Richie McCaw or Dan Carter. So that's that's what I'm trying to get at is that 80 minutes he was consistent. So um, though that, that's the rules you play under in, in that sense. Mm. We were lucky it just wasn't a game decider, I suppose, you know, um, in that kind of nature of game. In another game, it could yep. become an even bigger incident. But even if it is, it's still consistent within that 80. And mm. some players will be smart enough to know that on the attacking sense and start dropping their height into contact to get the reward as well. So again, that's what I'm saying. Like It's a, it's a skill. It's part of being a world-class player to adjust on the run to referee decisions. So you, in that situation, almost just have to let him get over the gain line and collar him down or something, you know, rather than being in front and trying to get the hit on. Well, I just think it's a, it's, it's, we're using a prop. Like if that was a Lucy or something, they'd get low enough. And that, that, like the All Blacks have shown their tackle technique is a low chop, get access for the turnover and the, uh, and the breakdown for the hunt. So you, you'd just change positions. You'd, you'd move, you'd move your big fellas in tied it to the ruck or something. I don't know. But I don't know what that answer is. It's, it, that's what I'm saying. It's up to the player or the players to to adjust on the run. Mm, mm. How do Wales bounce back from this? Obviously, they've got a lot of players coming in and they've got the Springboks next week who, you know, have been pretty impressive in recent times. Bryn, what do Wales do? Do you just make the wholesale changes and go with it? Or do you say, hey, these guys got some experience last week and we'll stick with a couple of them? Oh look, though, you know they're bringing some new some, some guys are going to come in to be able to bolster um, their squad and their team. And you know there's obviously a few injuries of um, for that test match against the All Blacks. But you know you look at the likes of Basham, you know who I thought was was you know was best on park for for Wales. And anytime we can bring a young guy and that has an experienced footy um, at that level, and he can can um, can end up playing so well against the All Blacks, you know that's only going to set him well. Or guys like that that play in that kind of um, play in that kind of game and play well, it's only going to um, upskill them moving forward. So, look, I think guys getting that kind of experience is going to be great. And, you know, the fact that they did play New Zealand, um, it's going to hold them well moving forward. But it is going to be a different style that they are going to face in the South Africans. So, um, I think probably the experience that they had against the All Blacks. And then when they are going to play South Africa, it's going to be a little bit of a different style, possibly, um, from what we've probably seen in the British and Irish Lions and, and the Rugby Championship. They um, are going to bring more of a kicking element. So, um, they might be able to change in and around that. And they're attacking brand. Uh, might might come a little bit um, a little bit easier than, than it did on the weekend, but no, I think they did they did really really well at some things in the game. Their set piece is one thing that they'll probably need to sew up, um, sew up especially with um, the South Africans and how well they are at their set piece. You know they've got to get their their line out right, and especially their scrums. It, just going back to our to our boys, you know I thought Joe Moody and Nepal Lali and big big times in those games. The scrum penalties through the eight were really crucial um, in stunting the momentum of the Welsh. So. I think set piece is going to be a big, um, a big key for for the Welsh moving forward against the South Africans who, um, against us, did really really well um, defending us. Um, but then at the same time, they've probably got an aerial attack coming as well through Fafta Clerk and Andre Polo through ten. I'll I'll just add in there Cody Taylor's in that front row too. You know, you just forget the hooker there doing that good work up front. Um, geez, Brunny's a crusader too, mate. Uh, for I can't for, keep, for me, I can't keep talking about crusaders, mate. <laughs> Mate, stop forgetting the hookers. I wanted, to get, I wanted to get Will Jordan in there, mate, but I couldn't. Sorry, carry on. You'll get there. Um, for me, it's tactically. Um, so it, it's what shifts they need to make um, in terms of their tactics. And by that, you know, Bryn sort of alluded to the set piece. That'll be one and making sure they can win their ball. But they played a lot of rugby between their two 40 metres, uh, between the two 40 metres. And, and that's quite energy sapping stuff. And, and they chance their arm. And, and, and they didn't really adjust their attacking style to that, um, I suppose, line speed pressure of, of the All Blacks. I mean, if you use Will Jordan's one when he pretty much tackled the midfielder coming from the wing. Um, and I think tactically they could have gone to their attacking kicks there. Maybe, you know, Anscombe did do one vi a wipers kick, but it was just a bit too far. But something like that to get outside of Rushdie, because that's what they're going to see again against South Africa. So not sapping so much of the energy with the crash and bash, you know, 50 or 40 metres or 60 metres out from your own line. Go back to your tactical kicking or your attacking kicking and put the ball back 
on top of them because they kicked 22 times uh, 28 um, to the All Blacks. So I don't think we would have expected that um, last week. So I, I think using their their boot a lot more will be will be one thing. And, and then obviously a big focus on skill execution. Um, as we've stated, they had opportunities aplenty and they didn't quite um, nail it through obviously errors, overthrows or um, penalties at scrum time. Um, so, so that's the big thing. But I think that kicking and not playing so much in and around that mid midpoint and wasting energy. Because let's not forget, Wayne Pivak said they fell off a cliff, and playing extra rucks 50, 40, 60 mm. meters out from your try line, and you're getting crashed and bashed um, through rush D. To me, mm. as a forward, I'd be looking at my team, going, "Get this thing in front of me, mate," because we're yeah. just going nowhere here. And and I think, I think it's the Preston, but Priestland came on, sorry, Bryn, Priestland came on and put a grubber in behind straight away. Mm. And he obviously saw it from the bench, put it straight in behind to try and slow the line speed, to change the pitch, yep. pitches, manipulate the pendulum, as Bryn talks about, to make it a little bit harder for the midfielders and the guys closer to ruck to rush. They have to chance around. But Will Jordan couldn't come from the wing to tackle a midfielder because their kick could come. So I think they just brought that into their game too late. They scored a try off it. So, um, you know, and... And TJ Perinara was trying things where he was just flying out of the line just before half half time. So again, that means there's kick space in behind. So there was mm-hmm. there, there's those tactics things that I think they can work on most rather than personnel. I, I think their personnel's there. They won the Six Nations. They, they, they're a good enough team to win against Springboks, but they'll have to bring their A game in terms of their tactics. Yeah. It's very, um, those spot tackles out wide were pretty good from the All Blacks, weren't they, Bryn? Yeah, just before, just before we get to that, um, Ross, I think it's really important as well, Joe. I think you look at the Australians and the kind of movements that they made against the All Blacks. And yes, they had two test matches and they got to be a couple of test matches to be able to figure that out. But I think you are right, Joe, because I think, you know, with Wayne, you know Wayne, he wants to play rugby, he wants to be on top of teams and be able to build a lot of phases. But, you know, if, if you get that wrong against South Africa, who have some really good jacklers, pretty much their whole forward pack can, can steal, steal the ball. So... You know, if you play that seven or eight phases around that kind of no man's land around the 40 to 40 meter mark to 50 meter mark, you know, Andre Pollard then is going to kick one from 50 and is going to be able to accumulate those scoreboard pressure. So I think being able to get that kick balance right, the Australians did it really, really well when they played the South Africans twice and they got that right along with their face play shape. So I think they have the ability to attack, but I think it's really important that when they do get down into those opportunities like, you know, the 37th and the 39th minute of their set piece, and they can get that right, then there, there might be seven points instead of instead of zero points. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be really important. And then um, coming back to your point on that one, um, Ross, yeah, I think it's really good. At you know, if you look around face place shape, and it's almost like it's spooking. You're spooking someone and saying that you're there in that space to you've taken away that space. But, you know, if you if you're good enough to be able to, you know, there could be a possibility of a bridge pass and attacking kick in behind. But yeah, I think it's really good. Whether it was TJ, uh, Will Jordan did it a little bit on the weekend as well, being able to get into that space and what it does. It gets you in the eye line of the 10 or the first receiver of whoever's got that ball. So, you know, let's just say, for example, you know, you've got your three forwards at the front. They pull it out the back to the first five. And if you're in, as soon as you get that ball and you get that as a 10 and you're looking up at the defense and you're seeing a winger nice and high, you're thinking, oh, the space isn't going to be able to get there. So I think then it's really important if you do see that, it's, it's on your outside to be able to communicate the next time that happens and saying, look, um, the 14's coming a little bit high. The nine who's going to be out, out who might be out there, it's coming to try and spook. So, the solution for around that is to be able to do a bridge pass and attacking kick like you know Bowden Barrett this isn't an example of a face play but you know Bowden Barrett put that kick in nice and early on to, to Rico because the fullback was central towards the post and there was space there so I think it's just going to be an improvement for the Welsh to be able to get those those comms in and the action words into their to their to their to their players because um, the space is going to be there and the South Africans are really good at being able to get those guys to staying high and taking away that space, whether it be with a winger and does it really, really well. And sometimes Fafta Klerk fights in and around that um, that edge side as well. Bryn, you, you mentioned, um, I suppose, adjusting the rush there. If, if we want to give a picture um, to the audience, is probably Anton Leonard Brown's try. Okay, if you can't get mm. the kick away and you can't find that edge, you watch Tupo Va'i keeps his hips square and down the ground and he gives the ball as he's still looking at the defender out the back to Bodhi. Bodie doesn't get spooked by that fly defender. Mm. He just he runs a little bit and basketball passes it over to Reeks. And then the other guy's flying at Reeks, and Reeks has kept his depth. He knows it's probably not mm. on for him. And he just gives that slide yeah. of hand to Geordie and then Geordie on to um, ALB. Now, that is through the experience they've probably had with the Springboks. 
and used yes. to trying to um they, they actually were probably that was the one thing they said when they came out of the spring box is they were disappointed with some of their option taking under that rushed defense and, and i think we saw it on that one that they're learning and growing just you know holding their feet really sucking and engaging those tight defenders in uh you know on on tupo vai's um square hips and ball out the back can go unnoticed and and unappreciated but you know not in the all-black environment but just from people watching but he holds about four defenders in there to create the space and time for Bodhi to see the rusher and not be spooked by it and then find the space where it is and then obviously Reeks his skill sets pretty um pretty special to get get that ball away but if you're not going to kick it that's that's the way is not get spooked you've got to believe there's a I way think, around it yeah. I think on that as well Chip to be able to get through that rush def- defense there's actually there's just a lot of parts that have to that go through that like if we've talked around the Australians and their kind of growth around having the animation getting that down ball runner out the back and then you've got rovers in and around so you know as a defense defense line if you're seeing that kind of animation you almost might pause a little bit because you don't know who you're going to get and if you look on that example of the edge with Tupo Vai Richie Moanga runs in a nice hard line and he's body of he pulls it a little bit and then gives it over the top but what Richie does there is it holds that defense as well if that's a flat four lines or flat four people, it's really easy to make decisions through that. So I think to get rush to get that rush defense, there's so many things within your face play shape that you have to get right. You've got to be able to ask questions for that for that defense to put them into this a sec, to be able to second guess, or else you get the likes of like what happened earlier in the rugby championship with the All Blacks, Sevi Reese being able to get those those bridge passes if there's no animation, pretty similar to what the Australians and what we've talked about in their growth in their face play shape. So would that be the thing that Ian Foster is happiest about, Jip? Or is there a bunch of other things on the list that you think he would have been happiest about with the progress from this game? Um, look, I think he'll be really wrapped with the way they orchestrated the win by the physical work they did in that first 40 um, and, and just chipped away. And, and they obviously had a plan, as I mentioned, about Sam Whitelock's plan to take the threes and get that scoreboard pressure. But, you know, we've, we've seen um, that same strategy and then not been able to ratchet it up. I think he'll be really, really happy with that last 20, 25 minutes and, and um, what they did there. And it wasn't just individual brilliance. It was a team effort, um, you know, apart from probably Will Jordan's try, but I still think Ethan Blackett had played a role in that by getting back and just creating a little bit more space for him. Um, outside of that, it was guys just working really hard off the ball, um, you know, as Bryn alluded to, running great lines that make defenders make decisions, that makes... The guy with the ball's job easier, and, and I think that is a big growth from where um, you know that rush D had had the All Blacks against the Springboks. Mm. Should we move on to the Test match of the weekend then, shall we? Um, the Black Ferns hundredth Test. It was a big occasion for them, but it didn't go very well against England. Forty three twelve was the final result. <sighs> Uh, you, you kind of feel they're a little bit set up to fail here and that they haven't played test football in a couple of years. The English team know them, know each other very, very well. They're playing at home. This was always going to be a big challenge for them, Jip. Yeah, it definitely was. And, and let's not forget um, a lot of opportunities for them to prepare for that test were taken away from them. They, they had tests against the Wallaroos. That would have been great, um, but they obviously got cancelled due to covid uh, they had other um, camps that had to be cancelled. And I think it probably showed the most in the defence uh, and, the, and the lack of connection. And, and they're probably still embedding a system or, the, you know, nine debutants are still, you know, trying to find their way in the system and connect with the players around them. And there were just gaping holes at time for, for the English players to run through. Or there was a, a stacked blind side of defenders that were marking, you know, a little amount of players and then you know obviously the English went wide or open and because they didn't marry up those numbers and work around into the open side they were left short and and some good hole running by the English so I think that was probably the biggest um, example of you know that they were underdone but I think everyone expects them to be underdone as, as I've just alluded to they've had test matches removed for a number of years now and um, what will be good is they'll be able to learn and rectify what we've seen with this coaching group and this leadership group that they, they won't be burnt twice. And I think there'll, there'll be a big shift in, a, um, in the accuracy and defense because I thought on attack, especially in that first 10 minutes, they were running hot and they were good again straight off the break, after the break. So I think if they can sort out their D, it'll be a lot 
um, you know, tighter contest and probably their kick strategy. I felt like, um, and, and I might be wrong, but I felt like the, the, the player that kicked the ball um, kicked because they thought it was right to kick rather than manipulating the D to kick on their terms as a team. And, and you can sort of see that in the chase line at, at times. Um, and, and maybe they kicked and because the winger didn't call that space, they're not chasing. Do you know what I mean? So felt like because there was no comms and nothing on due to the, the nature of that rush D from England, we sort of just aimlessly kicked in the kick strategy. Mm. So I think the defence and the kick strategy, if they can sharpen that up, it'll provide a lot less opportunity for the English. And then I felt like their attack was, you know, pretty powerful at times and, and probably a natural instinct and, and the one thing that they probably don't need to focus on as much this week. Mm. The English, though, you've seen those tries, Brenner. There was some really, really great execution from the English, particularly coming in from fullback. Yeah, she was out. Um, Ellie Kildun. Yeah, she was. Um, she was electric. I saw. Um, you know, a couple of her, just her, her ball in hand, very electric and had great. Um, had great footwork. And I think you know the biggest thing around that. Um, if you're talking around um, defensive pressure, and not and not getting it right. And if you're gonna gonna give ladies like that plenty of opportunities to be able to have one on one at least, uh, man on man or woman on woman, um, you're gonna come off second best. So I think it's important for the Blackfords moving forward. Um, you talk around cohesion. You know, you can you can really own those things around communication. So no doubt they'll go away, um, and they'd want to be able to rectify that and get in those communication communication, whether that be from a winger to a centre or a centre to a loose forward or whoever the connection is there. Because um, if you're not on the same page, you're going to see um, you know breaks in the line and um, a lot of line breaks. So the good thing around that is that they've got an opportunity to be able to play another game to get, to get these to get this right. So you know, Black Ferns team doesn't lose very often, and you know it was a if you talk about it, it was a centenary test around. The Black Ferns, and there was a lot of probably emotional uh, feelings going into their week, so it should be. It was, it, was, it was an awesome occasion for a lot of women in that team, and previously they had put a lot into that jersey. So um, they'll be hurting, and I know that coaching group will be will be hurting as well. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of lot of learnings through that, but um, if anything, uh, I, I expect them to bounce back and rectify a few things that, that they can control, as, as well as their set piece. You know, those are things, Jip, you talk around the parity around, around your, your forward pack. And, you know, if you don't get that right, it's pretty hard to be able then to be able to um, to win a game and, and go on your own terms and build pressure through that way. So um, it's going to be good learning for those girls and, and hopefully they can uh, have, a, have a long, hard week, get in that bone deep kind of prep and, and review of what, of what they probably will do and then be able to make those learnings and shifts um, coming up very, very soon. Some set piece struggles there, um, Jipper. The line outs were a real issue, and the English were able to just basically go to kicking it out whenever they wanted to because they felt like they could get the ball back. Um, is it easy to get that line out sorted in a week? Um, it is um, if if you make it, um, you know, sort of simple changes. I feel um, one of the easiest things that you can control is getting to your line out first and taking your tempo options. Um, so if, if you've got a high work rate and you get there and get set, um, even if you're coming from a blind side, you can still get up and, and move into your line out that way and take tempo. And if you can't take tempo, then the most simple way is to have a movement structure that leads to three or four options so that it's always looking like the same movement. So it makes the opposition think, oh, yeah, I'm in the race here, and they go to go up, but then you do one more slip or another sort of movement that pops up somewhere else. And then the next time you can go up where they thought you're going to go up and, and you've got a plan for what you're going to go through and, and you, you're wanting them to think it's the same movement every time, but you know you've got three or four options that you can end up at. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing um, they can control is either get to that ball and, and play quick throw-ins or get there first and take your tempo. That's the easiest, get in, get out. And, and they like playing at that tempo speed, um, the Black Ferns with ball in hand, so it would suit them. I thought as well, Chip, on, on that as well. Like, you know, if you're talking about those tempos, getting there really quick to be able to get them um, in behind and not, and not being set, you know, you look at Aisha, you know, with how good with ball in hand she was. You know, she's just a little, a little pocket rocket, and every time that she seemed to get the ball, she'd be able to get over the advantage line. You know, even getting an, an overthrow, um, getting to be able to get her into the game and getting over the advantage line then to be able to get into your attack structures through that. Because we've talked around it a lot, whether you look at Karevi or that kind of transition phase in, in the men's rugby, being able to win that battle there. You get the likes of our, of our outside, out, outside backs, be able to get them into that position where it could possibly be a one-on-one, -on -one 
with a with a side tackle with a hooker or a seven or a ten whoever whoever's out there in that, in that in that first channel. So yeah, ways through that or specials to be able to get um, a bit of confidence for that for that set piece. But you know, no doubt Growler will be getting them in um, you know for this next week and trying to suss out a few plans in place to to rectify that um, their set piece issues on the weekend. Well, let's look forward to this weekend. Obviously, the Black Ferns have got their rematch against England. We've got a few other big games. We've got the Wallabies versus Scotland, and the Wallabies camp has found itself in a little bit of a pickle with, I suppose, Samu Karevi, Quay Cooper, you know, pulling out late out of this tour, the players themselves voicing the fact that they wish they were there. They're just constrained by the contracts they've got in Japan. Uh, where do the Wallabies sit heading into the Scottish game? Bryn, how do you feel about their chances there, considering how important Quay Cooper and Samu Karevi have been to the way that they've played this year? Oh, it's a, it's a massive loss for them. But at the same time, you look around the All Blacks and you want to build depth and competition within the squad. You know, not too sure what, if not, not a, not a, I know Noah's going to be able to go over there, whether he's had enough time to be able to play um, in that test match. But look, I think it's just the next, with Dave Rennie, I can imagine him as the next, next person up. Next person up to be able to, to stake your claim for, for position, to be able to play well and being able to grow towards um, their, their, their whole end of year tour. Because look, they've even though they played against Japan and, you know, they didn't play as well as they previously had, but they got the job done and did a few things that they wanted to. So I think it's a good opportunity for some other guys to be able to come in. And yes, Kirivi, you know, Corby, now Cooper, McMahon, those guys aren't going to be there. But I can imagine that David Rennie, um, even through the rugby championship, a lot of guys came in through that kind of rugby championship um, format and played some really good minutes around that. So they have had the experience of being able to put guys in there and been able to perform and still win test matches. It just makes it a little bit harder with the experience that, you know, Quay Cooper and the likes of Karevi have brought into that squad. But, um, you know, they're confident at the stage because they've won test matches and they're not, it's not like they haven't lost a couple of games and they're trying to find a bit of confidence. You know, these guys are in red-hot form considering with how many test matches they've won back-to-back. So they'll see it as a challenge and I can imagine Dave Rennie will be really in and around that group trying to um, get the messaging right and then being able to say, it's next person up, you know, it won't even make it an issue around it. So... Um, I expect it really to be a real tight test match, though. You know, Scotland have, um, have did well in there. Always, always hard at home. So um, it's going to be a good challenge for the Wallabies and the next guys off the cave of the rank. Um, it's their job to put in a good performance and continue this uh, winning success with the likes of Quade Cooper, Kirivi and Corabetti when they were in there during the rugby championship. I, I just think the Wallabies, we've spoken at length about uh, um, them growing and their knowledge of their system and the style of play they want to. And, and I don't think it revolves around three or four players. I think uh, there's been a real shift in, in terms of how they want to play the game, but also how the, how much they know. It's almost ingrained in them now. Um, you know, they're, they're a team that likes to hold on to the ball, break teams down, but they can also um, kick positionally. And, and James O'Connor um, certainly can, can step up and play that role. He's, he's played fantastic all year. Yes, came back from an injury, but, you know, I don't think, you know, he's had a couple of runs off the bench, so he'll step up. I do think Samu Karevi is a bigger hole than others, um, but I think the fact that he's been in and around that environment, in and around that young um, centre group, uh, I, I think there is um, enough there that they would have taken from him to bring into their game. But watching Scotland play Tonga on the weekend, it will be no easy feat, man. They, they mm. were really effective. Um, their set piece and more drive was good, but some of their strike plays and their bodies in motion, and by bodies in motion, I mean... There's a number of bodies coming to that D line and you have to make a decision. And as a defender, you've got to make a decision, but also the ball carrier has got to make the right decision. And man, they were just picking them off. Um, Kyle Stain, I think it was, scored four tries, but it was just through those lines that Bryn talks about, about making defenders make decisions, changing the angle and creating that space out the back or giving it to the guy changing the angle. They were slick. They were really slick because Tonga started well and they picked away with a couple of threes. But man, every time they got within, you know, 30 or 20 odd metres, they, they were scoring points and, and making it look easy. But it wasn't as easy as they made it. Moving on to the Japan game against Ireland, I suppose it's interesting that Japanese players are available for Japan, but not necessarily for Australia. I have to do more research into that, I suppose. That <laughs> Actually, thinking, thinking of it, it is the interesting evolution of that league, because when you look at that league right now, in the past, we hadn't really worried about players being selected out of that league. The league's got to a strength now where quality players are being selected for international football. And maybe we need the Japanese league to better align with those test match windows, because 
you know, all the other leagues are having to align with the November window, the July window. Now we're in a position where the Japanese league isn't aligning with it and more top quality players are heading there as their number one place to get income. Uh, <laughs> any comment from anyone on that? Well, I think that's the key probably point of that is, is the number one value for the player and, and uh, the team employing them. And, and it might, yeah. you know, might have been part of the discussion and signing the contract. You don't know. They they might have said this, this is the expectation. This is the contract, but this is the expectation, and and they've they've called them on that. We we don't know. We're not privy to it. Um, I certainly don't think they'll be um, bending the rules. Um, to to I, I, it's obviously a contractual obligation. The way I read it, anyway. The message from Japan against Australia is we're right in this. So are Japan a legit chance to beat Ireland in Dublin? I, I just think both sides have got a little bit of unknown about them, um, you know, having not um, been able to play for a bit. You know, like Japan we saw against um, Aussie, and, and that was a, a great showing. Um, but, you know, it's it's one thing to do that at home and then to go um, to Dublin and, and win a test match, and, and the Irish will be up for it. They've been sitting there waiting. So th there's pros and cons to both sides, and there's, there's a little bit of an unknown for me um, to be able to be as uh, definitive as I usually am. So I'm, I'm excited by this test match. And, and I think, man, if, if Japan could do something special, I, I think it would really spice up international rugby. It would bring, you know, whenever they do these big one-off wins, um, you know, it, it's big talking points in the game of sport in general, not just rugby people talk it, but everyone starts talking it. So I, I think a victory away from home in Ireland would be, would be huge for our game as a whole. A bit of fun and outside of world cups as well you know like the, the big ones seem to come at the world cup so to get them more consistent i suppose across the board is the next step for japan Bryn, in between those big tournaments yeah it is anytime you can play against uh, you know a top tier nation away from home especially in the northern hemisphere it's um it's only gonna be able to make you make you better as a, as a team so you know, I think they, you know, you look at that 77th minute against Australia, they were in that game, and it wasn't, if it wasn't for Rob Valentini making that steal to be able to put to ice the game, you know, well, Japan were right into that game. So I think the improvement for them moving forward is that, you know, knowing that it's going to be in France in 2023, and the conditions could be a little bit more different than they're accustomed to being at home, being a lot hotter and, and dry ball. So what I did like to, in Japan and seeing that, and probably they didn't get the execution right with the contestable aspect, but... They've got that game to be able to do that because you know it could be you know don't know what the weather's going to be like in Ireland. It could be a little bit wet, and we know how much of a tempo mindset that the, the Japanese do have. So um, I did see that in, the, in that game they had the likes of their box kick being able to have it set up really quickly. So if they feel like they're not going anywhere, at least they've got their mindset of to be able to look. We're not going anywhere. We might put a contestable up off nine, or they might better do it at off ten. So I was I was really happy to be able to see that because knowing that you'd go to the Northern Hemisphere, having those that in your toolbox, and having to go from Plan A to plan B and that kind of um, we talked around that no man zone around the 40s around the 40s and in your exit area uh, I think it's going to be real crucial for, for Japan moving forward but then I think as well their set pace you know having that parity in set pace is always going to be something really important going into the uh, going into Ireland because look no doubt if you're looking at if you're at Ireland you want to really dominate that set pace area through scrum and line out and you know if Japan can run at that kind of 85-90% and, and nail nail moments with that set piece and big moments and win Win a, win a line out or win a scrum when they need to, um, then it could be in a very similar situation like they were against um, Australia. They were, they were in that game for the last, you know, where there would be the last couple of minutes and then, you know, that's when you can try and win a test match instead of it being um, previously where it might be um, a one-sided one -sided game against Ireland. Bruno, I think the other key is the Maul D as well. That's where they probably yep. lost the game. That was Aussie's last try and that'll be big for them on this tour is they really need to aim up and and have a plan around how they're going to stop these driving malls because the opportunities will come. That's just rugby. And, and then I've got to make sure that they don't make it as easy as they did for the Wallabies at the end of that game. Mm. And I would not be surprised, and I would not be surprised moving forward, seeing in this Ireland game um, something different or something out, out of the box with Tony Brown because I think they need to have a little bit of luck and something a little bit different outside the box uh, moving forward. And I can see you grinning. I'm not looking for a contract, Jippa. I'm not looking for a contract. <laughs> But um, you know, I do know Tony Brown with his time with the um, with the Maldives that um, he's got a great brain and been able to think and do something a little bit different. So I can imagine him and Scotty Hansen and, and the old trusted trio will be thinking of doing something a little bit different, maybe Jippa. 
hundred percent, mate. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> if they need a if, if they need a resource coach around the line out and stuff, I'm their man too. Let's get us both. Of them. Let's get us both of them. Yeah. <laughs> You've given up on joining Dave Rennie, have you? you you're going to switch tags. He doesn't. He doesn't need me, mate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Tony Brown, the, the ink is drying on the contract um, there for you, Brad. Um, just keep yeah. hammering. Just keep hammering. Man. Just keep chipping away. Keep chipping away. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we move on to some predictions? Obviously, let's start with that game, actually. Uh, Ireland for both of you or anyone picking an upset? Ireland for me. I just think at home, conditions, um, Travel, yeah. I mean, it's weighted in their favour. It'll be close, though. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Ireland for me. Okay. Uh, England, Tonga is probably pretty straightforward. Yes. I did like what I saw from Tonga. They, they, they had a plan. They took the threes from long range. They, you know, they definitely had a plan about how they wanted to play. Um, but defensively, they, they just... They just couldn't keep up with the pace of it. Springboks or Wales, Bryn? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Springboks. I'm gonna go Springboks for the fact that um, they were so they're so dominant with their set piece. And I'd probably think that they're really gonna try and attack that set piece area just for what they saw in the All Blacks uh, in the All Blacks game. And look, um, Wales have people that will be able to come back, and hopefully, not too sure how Alan Jones is is gonna be, but. I mean, with him leaving in that 20th minute, it kind of just, um, you know, having that kind of experience and look around his line-out leadership um, was probably lost. But, yeah, I think that kind of set-piece parity that the Springboks did really well against the All Blacks, they'll be able to go through that, looking at scrum penalties, the line-out more, and really taking their legs away from the Welsh. And then, um, you know, Fafta Klerk and Andre Pollard, their, um, their kicking game and putting them under pressure and, um, but to, and, and also their defensive line speed pressure. I'd like to think that they'll get it back to when they played the British-Irish Lions in that kind of 90, 90%, the high 80s uh, defensive pressure. I tell you what, I think the Welsh will be men possessed. Like, can we just give a round of applause for the Welsh fans? Like, didn't that stadium just look amazing mm -hmm. full and, and the atmosphere there? And no doubt it's what's facing the Springboks again. Um, but I, I think they'll be too good. Um, they're, they're too, you know, bigger threat at set piece. We, we saw the troubles and I know that players will be coming back and into the Welsh side. But again, that's a lot of moving parts, whereas the Springboks are, are being set, waiting and, and planning for this test match. And, and I think they'll be fairly clinical. And, and I think they're finding a way um, of playing in multiple sets of conditions. Um, and, and they have the, they have a way out um, and, a, and a style that they can, you know, I suppose, run between alternate ways of playing um, to, to give them the best ability to, to win more test matches. And, and I see it being no different this weekend. Just on that, Jip, just on that, you look around the All Blacks, right? So when they played the British and Irish Lions South Africa, they had a style. They just wanted to obviously kick, been able to put them under pressure through, you know, midfield bombs or a kick out in their kind of attacking zone. And obviously when they played the All Blacks, they changed it up just a, a little bit. They they went it through a little bit, especially in that last test match, but when they did have that inside that 22-metre zone, they knew that they just weren't able to give that ball back to the All Blacks because they would be able to get out and, and be able to let off that pressure. So for me, I'd really be interested to see if they're going to go back to that kind of kicking style and going back to like they did against the British and Irish Lions or taking the learning to how they were able to, like you said, Jip, go through that kicking zone, been able to have that kicking mindset, but then able to play with the ball and then been able to have their set piece as well. Because I think that's the, that's the recipe for the South Africans that I'd like to see them. Like they did in that last test match against the All Blacks. I look at that and that's, you know what? That's the blueprint right there, and it's going to be interesting because I know they played the All Blacks. They had to play like that to do because of how we are as a country and how we play. They had to kind of force their hand to play like that. But whether they do that against the other the tier, top tier nations moving forward, it'll be quite interesting to see if they do do that. I, I think it'll be based on conditions they face. They'll make mm -hmm. those decisions on the night. If they open the roof and it's wet, I think we'll probably see more of a British and Irish lines. If they shut it. Give them a chance. You'll see more of that that style that we saw against Argentina in South Africa, and mm. the way they played in that second test versus the All Blacks. Wallabies versus Scotland. We've done a bit of chat on them already, but where does this go? The Wallabies get the win despite Scotland being pretty impressive, Brent. Oh, man, I'm actually going to go for an upset here. 
I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Scotland. Yeah, I'm gonna go Scotland. Um, and look, not it's not to say it has nothing really to do with the Australians because we've we've been you know we've been advocates for the Australians in probably the last you know five six text matches. So, um, but I think just for the fact you talk around Samu Karevi, and like I know the other guys, you know, Iki Tao's played really well. You know, Hunter Paisami's there, and you know maybe even um, some other players might be able to come in there. But I just think with how Scotland played on the weekend, and yes, it was against Tonga, but. I think it's just going to be a different challenge. It's going to be different conditions, being a different place. And um, yeah, I just think Scotland will probably, you know, oh, this is just, I'm picking it. They might just make an upset here and probably win, you know, if a 3.1, very, very close. But yeah, I can just see Scotland possibly bringing up an upset uh, this week against the Aussies. Yeah, look, for me, um, this, is a, this is a big testing point. Like I know everyone's like, oh, I wish the Aussies could have played the All Blacks, but this is this is their big pressure point. Um, and, mm. and getting a win in this test match is huge and, and that's why I'll back Dave Rennie and the crew to, to get that job done because I think they'll know how important it is for them as a group but also their fan base and I think a lot of that is that's what they're playing for is, is their people back home and, and they're utilising that as a, as a you know a, a galvanising tool um, and, and I think you know yeah there's been a bit of changes more so in the in the back line but I think the platform that the Fords are putting on um, still enables the, the guys that are coming in to replace those senior men um, the opportunity to to exploit um, the, the Scottish. But it'll be close, there's no doubt. But I'm just backing um, the coaching group of the Wallabies and, and their leadership group to, to understand how important this test match is. France, Argentina, is this a difficult one to pick, Jipper? Um, it's, it's, I've been thinking about this one a lot and I suppose if you heard Ledesma's comments about the side and where they're at mentally probably not um, unless there's been a big turnaround in that and, and they've got away from rugby and had a really good freshen up um, but they have been on the road a long time um, and I suppose it's sort of alluded to the fact that they're potentially um, you know, overcooked as such um, and, and not getting the best out of themselves which is always a hard place to be and I think the French are preparing for that um, test at the end against the All Blacks, and they'll know how important it is to get their ducks in a row so that they can execute on that night. Mm. Yeah, I think I think for me, I think you know the French are probably you know playing this week and knowing that the All Blacks are to come. But I guess for me, what I, just what I want to see from Argentina is we talked around whether it be they played against the the, the Wallabies, New Zealand, or South Africa, their discipline was shocking. You know, we talked around, you can't give, you know, these top 10 nations opportunities time and time again. And, um, you know, there were sin binnings and you talked around even their set piece as well with their line-out drives, you know, had a couple of guys getting sent off in, in moments like that. And so for me, you know, if they can take away those penalties and there were spurts in, the, in those rugby championship games that when they were on top of teams, we saw the flair, you know, very similar to what the French do, you know, or the offloads, being able to go forward and being able to build pressure and scoring tries. But, you know, if they don't get that discipline right, uh, like they did in the rugby championship, then... It's going to be a long day against the French, but you know I think the French uh, will win this game. Even the, even if the Argentinians do get there right, I still think the French um, they have too much firepower, and um, yeah, will be really really wanting to gear up for that for that All Blacks in you know a couple of weeks time. I think it's just as key for the French to win this game, like I said with the Wallabies, to put a stake mm-hmm. in the ground because there was that inconsistency over the Six Nations where everyone sort of thought they were going to win, but then they you know ebbed and flowed a bit. They'd have an awesome performance and then a not so good one. So I, I think they really need to hit this, um, I suppose, end of your tour, hit the ground running and, and put make a statement and, and, and make other teams fear coming to play them at home. Um, and, and both sides, because of that emotional nature that they play the game, um, will always test that um, discipline, as you allude to, Brun. But a big test mm-hmm. for the French, I think. There's nothing to lose for Argentina, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, how about a tip for the Black Ferns versus England? Are we going to see a closer result? Is it possible to turn that around in a week, Jeffa? Oh, it'll it'll be hard, but I think we'll see a closer result. Um, but as I said, they they're going to need to embed, um, you know, that that understanding of each other and those communications on defence and and in their kick strat. Um, so I, I don't know if it can be turned around and 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 be victorious. But if there's ever a side. That will do it. Um, you know, the Black Ferns are probably a side that are capable of it because I feel like the dust could have 
you know, been blown off and, and, and now they're like, oh, that's over. We know we know what to expect now. We know where we're at and, and it can really um, sharpen the focus and the desire during the week to lead to a big performance. So it's not without possibility, but it will be a very, very big hill to climb. Hmm. Is it really hard, Bryn? Is it is it really difficult to come back from something that large? We've seen the Wallabies do it fairly well against the All Blacks in recent years when they've been hammered and then be back in the running next week. Yeah. Oh, look, it, it is going to be tough just with how so with how dominant the, the English women were. But I think a lot of those things that they can they they can control themselves. You talk around the defensive side of the, the ball, being able to get that cohesion and understanding whether that be going away having a look at some clips and being able to get connect with the outside groups or the loose forwards or whoever's in those kind of decision-making um, defensive reads that you have to make. You can you can do that on tour, and it's the one really good thing when you are on tour. There's so much time that you can spend with each other and being able to rectify a lot of those things on the field and in the classroom and away from the footy field. So I can imagine that they'll be having those chats. The leadership group will be able to own that and get those things in place around that. But then, then also the set piece aside as well. Gypsy, there's some great solutions that they could go for with a lot of tempos, being able to have a few specials if it goes over the top to Ali or Aisha or something like that. But I think, you know, the, the, they didn't want to lose that test match, obviously, but, you know, you, make, you can make a lot of learnings from, from losing a test match. And if you look around the Black Ferns in the past, they haven't lost many games in their test matches. So I can imagine that they're a hungry group and you even look at their, their messaging around on Instagrams and how togetherness, how much togetherness they have with that group. Um, there's nothing better when when you're a player when you're under the pump and um, you're the you're the underdog. When when do we really talk around the Blackfords being an underdog? So um, it's going to be a good learning for them to show a little bit of resilience and character. Uh, but I reckon they'll get their get their prep a little bit better. And then you know, all you want to do is give yourself a chance to win a game. And so if they can rectify a lot of those things that we've talked about t- uh, today, um, and it's a close game, then anything can happen. And then the big the big time players can um, can step up and you know, win a test match for them for them uh, this coming week. So is that England or the Black Ferns? Just, just looking for your pick on that one. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go our Black Ferns. I'm gonna go for Black Ferns. Good on you, boy. I'm gonna pick them. <laughs> Come on, girls. Come on. Nice, nice, nice. Good work, Bryn. And uh, of course, the All Blacks are heavy favourites uh, in comparison to that. Um, heading into the Italy game, it really is just a matter of by how much. Uh, most likely. Um, Jipper, how much? Oh, it'll be 50 plus, I'd say, um, without being too disrespectful. Um, but it, it, it will it'll be a, a tough hill to climb that they've struggled, obviously, in the Six Nations earlier in the year. Um, and this, this task gets no easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's as simple as that. Simple as that. I think um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of points. But I think um, you know, knowing Ian Foster well, from his messaging throughout, even games against Tonga and the Americans, um, they'll have some clear plans around what they want to what they want to get out of that out of that game. So uh, whether that be exiting really really well, like they they did against the Americans that they didn't do against um, in the rugby championship in some games, not very well. They'll find some form of um, stuff that they haven't been really good at. Um, even when they played so good against Wales, they'll find out a few things that they didn't do well and. Those will be focal points or movements around what they want in those kind of um, scenarios and, and being better moving forward because um, a lot of probably a lot of men in their All Blacks group are going to get opportunities to play and then now it's their job to be able to um, implement the things that the coaches are wanting to have their having their plan around what that looks like but then at the same time taking their chance because knowing that you know the Ireland and, and the French the French game is going to be probably our, our best twenty three moving forward. Yes, another big weekend. Uh, Different kinds of results required for all sorts of different teams. The All Blacks looking to impress again against another understrength team before going into the big boys. Catch us all again next week on Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Bryn Hall, James Parsons, Ross Carl, Matewa.